you to buy his book. Um, and also because I'm wondering whether uh, when Robbie invited me to join the Savio board in early June, and I found myself and subsequently sucked into a vortex of organizing and talking to faculty and students and staff about how to deal with the budget crisis, how do we respond to that, um, and thinking and tying everything I'm doing into that ongoing struggle, whether this whole thing is just a figment of Robbie's imagination, because it's all here in the book. So that's the part I'm gonna to read to you now that seems like an uncanny uh, description of the history we're living out today. And um, with that, I turn us to page 299 uh, in uh, chapter 12 called Dying in the Saddle, which um, describes the last chapters of Mario's life. The final political battle of Mario Savio's life erupted at Sonoma State University in fall 1996. The issue was a proposed $300 fee hike that he believed regressive, sneaking in tuition under another name. It made the university too expensive for low-income students. This differential fee proposed by President Amanyana would have to be approved by a referendum before it could be implemented. To Savio, the process by which the administration promoted the fee proposal seemed unethical. The administration used its influence to discourage opposition and its resources to flood the campus with pro-fee hike propaganda while failing to provide equal access to the fee's critics. He saw this as a free speech issue since one, side views, one side's views were privileged over the others without a fair hearing, making a mockery of the democratic process. Although the fee fight was waged on one campus, it came in response to a larger educational crisis raising issues, working class and interracial access to college, conservative defunding of public education that were of statewide and national significance. Critics suggested that the state budget slashing that caused CCU's fee battle was part of a right-wing drive to reserve public higher education's democratizing impact on late 20th century America, starving public universities just as they were becoming more racially diverse. In California, this defunding proved so severe that within a three-year period in the 1990s, Quote, the state's four-year public universities lost about a fifth of their per-student public support. It is a little wonder, then, that Savio was drawn into the fee fight as a social justice issue as well as a free speech cause. Jumping ahead to page 303. Coming from a working class background, Savio, who had never had much money, knew that $300 was a lot to many students, particularly minorities. The conflict tapped into his social sensibility regarding education. Quote, this is uh, Mario's own words, a university education is as necessary to a decent life as a high school diploma was 75 years ago. What is necessary should be free. Fees should be coming down, not going up. Page 311. Though largely ignored by the national news media, whose obituaries focused on Berkeley in the 1960s, Savio's 1990s activism reveals a good deal about him and the fate of 60s radicalism. His 90s organizing was an activism of defense, defense of affirmative action, immigrant rights, and low-cost public higher education. The right had done so much to put the gains of the 60s at risk that the struggle now is to hold on to old freedoms rather than aspire to, new, to win new ones. What is also striking is that with the Reagan-Gingrich-Wilson political earthquake shifting the political ground in California, Savio's 90s activism was free of the attacks on liberalism that had been such a major element in 1960s New Left discourse. Savio's final political battle against the fee hikes called upon SSU to return to the California State University system's liberal tradition of making itself accessible to low-income students. That tradition, codified by California's Master Plan for Higher Education back in the 1960s, had as its primary author the leading liberal educational planner of his day, Clark Kerr. <laughs> the budget cuts conservatives implemented constricting public higher education in 1990s California, which set the stage for SSU's fee initiative, provoked resistance, a call for democratic educational access that united liberals and radicals. In this moment, at least implicitly, the radical Mario Savio and the liberal Clark Kerr stood for once on common ground. <laughs> Page 314. 
page 312. The Sonoma chapter tells us about the end of Savio's life and also raises questions about another death, that, that of the insurgent 60s. The backlash politics Savio struggled against in his final years attests that the right was dominating California and exerting great influence nationally. America had gone from liberalizing its immigration laws in the 1960s to voting to deny immigrants social services in the 1990s. It had gone from enacting historic civil rights legislation in the 60s <coughs> to approving ballot initiatives outlawing affirmative action and from expanding to cutting back on programs to make higher education accessible to the poor. Nor had mass movements arisen that could stop all of this. This string of conservative triumphs suggests that the 60s, which Savio helped to define as an era of egalitarian change, had passed into history. The new left was dead. Or was it? After all, there was Savio, decades later, picking up where he had left off in the 1960s, doing all that he could to preserve the gains in racial, gender, and class equity that had been won by his generation. This involved not only political activism, but also professional work a 1990s counterpart to his labor in Mississippi Summer Freedom Schools, teaching remedial math to low-income SSU students whose skills had been limited by a public school system riddled by class and racial in inequity. And now I'd just like to read um, from Mario's words themselves in a speech he gave um, called Resisting Reaganism and War in Central America, which also seems to resonate with today. And this is on page 347, um, and with a little editing. Following the lead of black people, one group of oppressed people after another cast off, discarded, the definitions of inferiority by which society was keeping them powerless or poor, one group after another. All of these groups together are a numer numerical majority in America. We are the majority. Now let me say to you something that this means. The majority makes demands. The minority calls the majority the interest groups. So now you have to struggle between the new majority to take control of our society, the democratic society. We are the majority. And on the other side is the aging, old establishment minority. We could break the bank for them, given the way in which they've got the pie split up. We discovered in the course of struggle that if the needs of each of these groups that formed a new majority were to be met, and they often were needs expressed very appropriately in demands on the public authorities. America would have to change direction. We discovered this especially in the 70s. America would need to change direction. <coughs> How? I, fortunately, and it gives me a certain liberty, am not a Marxist, and so I can say it. America, to accommodate the just demands of the new majority, has to become at least a little bit less capitalist. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>